Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 CXM Best Practices Symposium. My name is Darren Hood and I'll be talking to you today about UX maturity levels. This is a talk I've delivered in the past. I've tweaked a few things, especially for this event. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Before we get into the main crux of the subject I want to talk about today, let, let's level set and just talk about what I call the experience landscape first. We have BX, which is the overarching part of the experience landscape. Any and everything that happens with any experience design or experience oriented efforts falls under BX. And it's not something that you can design for per se. Everything that you do across all the other experience types feeds and basically results in the brand experience. What a perception, uh, uh, the, the perception, I should say, that somebody has of your business, of your solution, of your product is a result of what you do across the others. Next, you have CX. And of course, we're at a CX conference, so we know what CX is. Customer experience is looking at the various touch points from the beginning of the time a person engages with your product or solution or your brand all the way through to the purchasing funnel, all the way through to support and back into the purchasing funnel once again. So CX focuses on all those touch points. So you could say it's a subset of BX in a sense. UX, user experience, that's part of what we're going to talk about today. This is talking about a specific uh, uh, aspect of the experience. It's talking about how they interact with a solution, how they're interacting with your product. It's talking about the, the designing from the beginning to the end of how somebody interacts with what it is that you're providing to them, what they have purchased from you, what it is that they're using, things of that nature. And you have people that are specifically set, as you do with CX. You have people that are specifically and strategically established to make sure that those user experiences are optimal. Lastly, and just to throw this in there so everybody's aware, so we're coming to the experience landscape as a whole, learning experience. This is where UX principles, CX principles are applied to a learning experience, to education, because we have a tendency to think about UX when it has to do with, say, a website or a mobile app or maybe a handheld device or things of that nature. Learning experience takes a lot of those same principles, but it just focuses strictly on the, the education that someone is receiving, that educational experience and making sure that it is also optimal. All four of these make up your experience landscape. I just want to level set and touch on that today, but we're going to go straight into user experience. So what is UX? Uh, a lot of people will, if we were live and I was there with you, I would ask people to say, Hey, what, what would you say UX is? How would you define user experience? And the definitions are all over the place. A lot of people, frankly, they, they do think they know what user experience is, and, and it, it's even difficult for a user experience professional sometimes to describe what UX is. I'm just going to touch on it briefly today. This is uh, a, an illustration that I share. I call it the landscape of UX, and I refer to it affectionately as the four pillars because UX consists of four main pillars, heuristics and usability, information architecture, UX research, and interaction and interface design. And then there's a lot of subsets here. There's a lot of deliverables, a lot of artifacts, a lot of methods and methodologies. All of these make up UX. I guarantee you that when a lot of people say UX or when they're trying to speak about UX, they are not talking about all of these things. So what somebody knows, what somebody brings to the table, it's going to vary, of course, when you have people with different experience levels, but this is what it is. This is what we're all shooting for. This is what we all as UX professionals want to engage with and what we seek to deliver. And as we're advancing in our career, we want to, uh, our, we want our acumen to increase across all of these elements that are on screen. So this is UX. Makes me think about the ROI. This is an old classic illustration from a video that's still out on YouTube 
It was created by Susan Weinshank, and she's one of the the leaders in the field, especially when it comes to the psychology um, aspects of UX. Uh, She is one of the foremost experts on it. Uh, She has a wonderful brain and behavioral science certification available on her website. I highly recommend that. Um, She produced this in conjunction with the folks at Human Factors International. And I just wanted to touch on a couple of things here because it helps to broaden our, our our mindset again with regard to what our perception of UX is. Uh, she defines it, I love her definition, as the science and the art of designing a product. And that extends to services, it extends to solutions. Whatever it is that you're designing, there's an art and there's a science. There's methodologies and then there, there is a look and a feel, and the, the aesthetic component that's a part of it as well. All those things are, are, are part of UX and part of what we're trying to make sure that we optimize. But I want to touch on a couple things here again in the name of broadening our perceptions today so we're all on the same page. UX helps, if you notice in the middle of this illustration, it, that the time spent reworking things that are not done well, 50% of the time, uh, that that the the efforts that are going forth with with a developer team, a development team, is spent reworking things. When UX is established properly, and as we're going to talk about, when the UX material level is where it should be, you can help eliminate that. User research, testing, the whole user centered design component of UX that takes a lot of effort. Some of it can be done quickly. Some of it takes a little longer than others. But no matter what you do, it's important to engage in research because you want to validate designs. And sometimes you actually have to use that data to manage stakeholders, hippo influence, the highest paid person's opinion, for those that don't know what hippo is, things of that nature. There are a lot of abandoned projects out there. But you know, if you have a good, solid UX team and you present what it is you're trying to do, a good, sound UX professional will let you know a lot of times whether or not what you're trying to accomplish is really doable or whether it's beneficial because we're approaching it and we're presenting things from a heuristic perspective. So again, just a few little tidbits. So, so that we're UX is not just in place to make things look pretty. Matter of fact, that's not our job at all. It's our job to make things easy to use as possible and to make sure that we're finding the sweet spot between user needs, business needs, and any constraints that may come up. A little bit more about ROI. This illustration was was published in 2016. It actually, it says copyright 2016. It actually was published in 2017. My memory serves me correctly. And the Design Management Institute published a study on two separate occasions. This is the most recent one that's in the wild. The other one, the numbers were actually higher. But what they found was that design-led organizations outperformed their competition by, when this was published, 2017, by 211%. These are the companies that have sound UX practices in place. And when some of the earlier research was published, NASA, IBM, I believe it was NASA who said that for every dollar you invest in UX, you can get up to $100 in return, which is what sparked a lot of corporations wanting to get on the UX bandwagon. It's really good to call it that because it's really what it is. So a lot of people are running after this ROI and uh, we, we need UX teams, bring the UX people in here. I had a job once where somebody, I found out that I had the position because somebody made a decision to, to set up a UX team, uh, that whole uh, process of making that decision took all of three seconds, and and that's part of what we're going to get to. You're going to see what I'm why I even bring that up here today. People hear about the ROI, they're excited about the ROI. Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to be efficient, and everybody wants UX. It has appeared on several lists: the UX professions, different types of UX work have appeared on on top and promising careers for several years, but there is an inherent problem. And that's what we want to address and solve for many of you today. Now, you would think, 
Well, Darren, what are you getting at? Uh, you know, we we got a growing UX team. We didn't have a UX team five years ago. We've got 20 people now. We have a really wonderful UX team, and they're doing great things. And the question I have for you is, are you sure? Are you sure that your UX team is doing doing great things? And And this is going to be a challenge point for many people today. It is not enough. And I love how someone said it once. I'm going to repeat the way they said it. I, I borrow it. And I, I share it often. Decorating your your space with UX personnel is not the same as having a sound UX practice. And having people in place, it's easy to pat yourself on the back because you hired three or four UX people. But wouldn't it be better to have a UX team that's properly structured where you've got senior or seniors, and then you've got junior, uh, juniors, and you've got your seniors that are helping the, the the juniors to advance their careers, and and everybody's working together and sharpening those saws and making things better. Isn't that what we want to do? And, and 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 part of where we're going today is is anybody tending the sheep? What do I mean by that? You can have people in place. But what escapes many people when it comes to UX is that UX is a practice. It's a discipline, a discipline that most companies are just getting involved with over the course of the last five to 10 years. Some companies, even though UX, even in its earlier stages when it wasn't called UX, was uh, it was in the early 2000s when, when a few companies started getting on board then, Everybody doesn't have that luxury of having had an established UX practice in their organization. And those that are just jumping on the bandwagons miss what you're about to see here today. So again, it's not enough just to have people on staff. We need to take this a few steps further. And and what I propose to you is that you need to always make it a point that you are keeping the pulse taking the pulse, keeping the pulse of your organization's UX maturity level. You also need someone that is skilled enough in UX that they can manage the UX maturity level. This is a grossly overlooked aspect of UX today. You you thought you could hire some project managers and just bring them in and they know what to do and you let them go and everything is fine. You bring in some some quality analysts and you let them go and do their thing and everything is fine. Those disciplines have been around much longer than UX. And those disciplines don't have people in mass jumping on board, getting seeking these positions, getting hired and bringing frankly nothing to the table. So people are are clamoring for these UX positions in their company and establishing the the positions. But there's also a bunch of people out there clamoring to get hired into the positions. And if you don't have a sound maturity level, you're going to hire the wrong people. And you're going to hire those people who really don't know what UX is. And as a former UX manager, I have seen it and I've talked to people around the world. A lot of people are falsifying their UX qualifications and if you don't have anybody to run interference and and spot those people and flag those people, yeah, you can have a UX team of 20 people. How many real UX professionals do you have? And so you're going to see how that, how that actually plays into it here. So what is a UX maturity level? What is that really all about? We're going to give you some definitions and then we're going to show you some examples. So a UX maturity level, basically it describes the levels of your evolution, your operation, and your status as it pertains to UX. How mature are you? Think of think of it from that perspective and asking that question. How mature is my organization? We have a UX practice. How well are we really doing? I mean, do you have somebody who can objectively look at it and then strategically 
take charge of that to make sure that they're driving the organization forward and driving the skill level of your team members forward. Those are the things that are associated with having a strong UX maturity level. It's not enough to have team members. You remember the, the Harlem Globetrotters and they would always play these guys, the Washington Generals? If I remember correctly, they only beat the Harlem Globetrotters once in like 60 years or something like that. Do you want the Harlem Globetrotters? If you get my drift, or do you want the Washington Generals? In other words, do you want somebody who's skilled and really knows what they're doing? Or do you just want to have a team for the sake of having a team, even though they don't produce anything? And and if we don't manage maturity levels, that's what that's the risk. And that's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost your company a lot of money. It could cost you your reputation. It's going to cost the users because the users are going to be made to suffer needlessly, not because of the the skill levels, the maturity level. It gets left to itself. And we'll talk about that again before we wrap up today too. So again, maturity level, UX maturity level is about the levels of organizational evolution and operation. Where is your practice? Where does your UX practice stand? And when you see the examples, that'll help this to, to be a bit more digestible make a little bit more sense for you if you're not getting it now for whatever reason. Why are UX maturity levels an important business factor besides what I've already mentioned uh, today? Well, basically, you remember what I mentioned earlier that you had the companies that outperform their competition by 211%. Well, basically, the more mature an organization's UX operation is, the more they will outperform the competition, the better you will be, the more satisfied your users will be, the more optimal the, exper- the, the experience will be, the, uh, the more satisfying, the more delightful the experience will be because you have people knowing, because they've done research, they know what will satisfy users. They've proven it. They're not spitballing it. They're not guessing. They're not faking it until they make it. They know we know exactly what we're shooting for. And so when we deploy something, it, some people will say, well, you know, Darren, we, sometimes we just need to do a minimum viable product. Well, ask yourself, think about that V. Is it viable? Because a lot of people roll out what they say is an MVP because they know the, they know the acronym, but are you really rolling out something that's viable? A sound UX practice with a sound UX maturity level will help you to deploy something that is truly viable. Because sometimes, hey, that's just the way business is. We don't have time to do as much, everything we'd like to do. So we need to roll it out in increments. It's like, so, okay. But let's make sure that we're sound. Let's make sure it's truly viable. It's already minimal. Let's not have an MEP, as I like to call it, a minimal effort product. Let's have a minimal viable product. So the more mature your practice is the more you're going to outperform the competition and you're going to drive more loyalty as well. Statistics have shown that a stronger UX practice drives more business loyalty. You, you, you hit your KPIs better when you have a strong UX practice. If you hit them without the practice, that's the whole blind squirrel mindset and the blind squirrel, they say the old saying blind squirrel can find the nut. You can, but you're not going to excel if you don't have these things in place. UX maturity levels provide a means of examination that will also help provide a way to measure your status, your progress, and it helps you to establish goals for your team. It helps you to, when you realize where you are, hey, we're at this level today, What do we need to do to get to the next level? That's that strategic aspect of it. And UX strategy is another thing. We're not going to talk about that today, but that needs to be in place. That's part of what helps drive strong UX maturity levels. So let's look at a few examples. Got a a handful of examples here. and There is no shortage of UX maturity models out there. And I'm going to say this now because I probably forget to say it later. There will, you will find maturity models that may or may not work for your organization. This is something you can design on your own so that you can 
you can put together a maturity model that fits for your business model as well. Don't don't try to put the square peg in the round hole, but you can look at different maturity models and you can get ideas from them. And that's part of the reason I'm sharing all of these. This is probably the most famous, and it was the first UX maturity model that was published. And it was created by Jacob Nielsen. And there are several steps here, ranging from hostility towards usability all the way up to a user-driven corporation. And as we take a closer look, I'm going to look first at the these initial parts. Hostility towards usability. If that's what you have in your organization, if it exists anywhere at all, you're on the bottom rung of that ladder. And you've got a lot of work to do. Your team has a lot of work to do. If the user experience is managed by developers, and a lot of people pride themselves on that, if that's what's going on, you are at the lower level of UX maturity, and you need some work there, where people are doing things by intuition. Uh, Google does it like this. I don't like that. That's all gut feeling and intuition. That's not mature from a UX perspective. Then there's skunk works where the stakeholders, they are not concerned about expert opinions. They'll say, oh, that's your opinion. No, there's a difference between expert opinion and opinion. So when people take the expert opinion and discount it or disregard it, but the uh, you're not doing the other things, then that means you're at the skunk works level. And until you get past skunk works, you truly have not really made any progress because a lot of organizations I've observed in my career are all cycling around those three. All, there's hostility, developers are taking charge. They're developers, not designers. They'll take charge, not good. And then you have skunk works. You don't want to go in vicious circles. You want to make sure that you're progressing up the ladder. We take a closer look at Jacob Nielsen. One of the things I, I really one of the reasons I share this is because of the time, the time that uh, timeline that that he provides. Uh, it nobody is interested in things taking that long, so I, I share this because if you look this up and go on the internet, you'll find this. So I'd rather speak to it than have you discover it. And I want to mention you have to throw those timelines out and just keep going forward. You want to make sure that usability is being planned for. That's level four. Make sure that people are thinking about it across the organization, that you're listening to your UX team. Don't just bring them in and don't listen to them. You want to track the quality of the UX. Just a lot of levels here that we need to pay attention to. So again, this is the oldest and most prominent out there. But there are others. Uh, Zebia Group has one that's a bit more practical. And, and they, they have some timelines associated with theirs too, but they start out where things are oblivious to people or people are oblivious of UX, I should say. Then there's some interest. Then you start to get a little bit of investment. Then you have some people that are, that it starts to become a bit more committed. And according to Zebia, you're four years behind where you should be if you really want optimal maturity. Then when you get to the point where UX is embedded in your organization's operation, true UX, not, 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 uh, uh, the trends of the day, real UX. Remember those, those four pillars, when those things are being done, that's true UX. And then when the whole organization is user centered, you're going to just grow by leaps and bounds and you're going to make all types of great progress and you're going to have tons of accomplishments. So that's where you want to be. Well, we need to cover this. Here's another model from Leah Bewley, and she is one of the early practitioners of UX. And I am not sharing this model because it is great. I am sharing this model because I want to, as I said, if you go on the internet and search, you'll find this, and I'd rather address it. This is a dangerous model. One, because there's no, re no way for you to progress from one level to another. And I have spoken with people who think that this really lets you know that you can move fast. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't have to take 30, 40 years like what Jacob Nielsen was talking about. However, um, you, you have to make progress and 
just to illustrate what I mean by this one being a bit on the dangerous side, level four talks about testing and learning, concept testing, A-B testing, uh, analyzing data, which also means you're going to be synthesizing data. That should be happening earlier. If, 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 if So this is why it creates this mindset that this is something that you can, oh, we can get to level five in, in a year. No, you can't. This is This does not really reflect the wisdom that's available in the earlier models and the other models. So if you see this, uh, you want to take it with a grain of salt. If you're, you can do wireframes, it's not just for level one. You can you you can do wireframes and comps and interactive prototypes on level five. So, so it, it can be a little bit deceiving. So if you come across this one, please be careful of this model. And then uh, one of the last ones we'll cover I have two more, Wondrick, uh, and excuse the typos in his illustration here. This is another one that's very practical. This is, this is one that you can, no timelines, just grow. Just grow. Uh, UX is unrecognized initially. Then you have interest. Then people start investing. From They go from being invested to com- being committed. Then they become fully engaged, and then you want to reach the point where it's embedded. So you can see these are the steps and start to identify what can we do to get from one level to another. And I hope you can see this is well beyond just having people on your team. Here's the model I put together where you have apathy initially, then people start to explore UX, then it's adopted. After adoption, you reach a point of saturation, and then after saturation, you ascend to assimilation. So this is this is nice and simple, practical. You should be able to observe your organization, see where you are. So it helps the maturity level, uh, the, the different levels to sink in, and it gives you real goals to shoot for. So again, there's no shortage of UX maturity models. They are everywhere. So there's plenty out there for you to tap into and to use in your brainstorming. And again, you can come up with your own UX maturity model but you need one. <laughs> that's, that's the key. So as we begin to wrap up, here's some what's in it for me statements. For stakeholders and teams, it helps you to identify your team's potential, helps you to understand the team dynamics, as yes, it does, provides management cues, things that you need to do to make your team better, to make the organization better, the strategy I mentioned, helps you to gauge your team's status. For management and growth, it helps you to to evaluate candidates when you're hiring. you can. There is such thing as a personal UX maturity level. And you want to know how mature that person is from a UX perspective before you bring them on board. Helps you identify not only the candidates' maturity levels, but you can identify the maturity levels of your team members. And then you can develop growth plans because if you invest in their professional development, then that's something that really helps you to manage attrition and helps to really produce happy a great environment with happy employees. Also fosters understanding of your own maturity level and planning for personal growth. So you need to know where you are. When it comes to you, if you're looking for a UX job, it helps you to identify suitable job openings. You want to go preferably to a company that has a higher UX maturity level. Helps you to evaluate whether or not you should should subscribe value to a position. Whether or not you need to Uh, disqualify an opportunity because it's paradoxical. It looks like an opportunity, but really it's a trap. So watch out for those paradoxes out there. And it helps you to mark potential intrinsic value in an organization. Because if you love UX, you want to be in an organization that does it right. It makes you feel better, makes you happier. So as we wrap up today, give you my little equation, UX plus CX equals BX. You cannot design for BX in particular. It is an automatic result of how well your UX and your CX is implemented. UX is a subset of CX. We want to recognize where it fits. And it's not this thing where we make things pretty. It's much bigger than that. There's a lot more going on than a lot of people think. UX is critical to every organization, but don't forget, it must be done correctly. You can outperform the competition but only if you have the right pieces in place, only if you have the right cogs. In addition to staffing your team with the right people, please take care to manage your UX maturity level. It's not going to manage itself. You have to have strategies in place to
to make sure that things are structured properly. Again, don't just have a team. Don't just have people in place. Make sure that somebody's paying attention to the UX maturity level. And lastly, as you're doing all these things, as you're striving to get better and make your UX practice more exemplary, be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. You're not going to get there fast. Just make sure that you get there. Thanks for taking the time to join me in my talk today. Don't forget to check out the World of UX podcast on CX of M Radio. I'm glad you took the time out to, to join me in my talk. Have a great remainder of the symposium.